Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I have to share a recent review from Apple Podcast. Sun Andra wrote, Since I started gardening my backyard with native plants, I have been on a quest for more information about the native ecology in my area. There are so many wonderful podcasts available out there, but this one is by far my favorite. Shannon has very interesting guests, and she has a knack for leading the interview in a way that is informative without being esoteric. I always appreciate how polished and professional the podcast is. The discussion stays on topic, and yet one feels a spirit of camaraderie between guest and host and listener. Shannon is delightful, and her joy and enthusiasm for the natural world is infectious. Highly recommended. As I read this, my heart swelled, and I felt truly humbled. Thank you so much. I am so grateful for all of my listeners and readers, and I appreciate all your emails, comments, and reviews. They always bring a smile to my face, and it makes my day to know that you are finding such value in the content I am providing. But to get back to the podcast, today we are talking with John Seymour and Robert Hoffman from Roundstone Native Seed. John is the president of Roundstone, and Robert is the restoration ecologist. Hi, John and Robert. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thanks for talking with me today. Hey, how are you doing? Doing well. Hey, Shannon. Thanks for having us. Hey, I'm so glad you guys could come on. So let's get started by just telling us a little bit about who each of you are and what you do. Robert, you want to start us off? Yeah, I can start you off. Yeah. So I'm the restoration ecologist for Roundstone Native Seed, and that's just basically a fancy way of saying that uh, you know I help people convert uh, their existing vegetation to native vegetation, uh, and especially nowadays, the most popular thing is for pollinator habitat is what a lot we deal with. So I do a lot of the project management as well as consulting uh, for Roundstone Native Seed, where I will go out to people's farms and uh, and houses to help them. Uh, realize how they can use native plants to achieve their goals that they're basically getting at. I'm actually originally from Tennessee, so I'm not originally from Kentucky. We were based out of here in Kentucky, as John will mention later, but uh, I'm originally from Tennessee and went to school at the University of Tennessee at Martin and also went to the uh, University of Florida. So I went to the University of Florida down there and got my graduate degree. And, uh, done a lot of work, been working with natives now for uh, a little over 12 years. Uh, dealing with native plants. It's been a blessing. It's a fun, it's a fun venture to deal with. What about you, John? I'm what's left of John Seymour. I am, uh, as Robert said, the president of Roundstone Native Seed. So basically what I do here is uh, I do my best not to micromanage. I have a really good team of people that uh, have been working with me for a long time. It seems like everybody's got their own specialties and they do a really good job at it. But uh, I'm still heavily involved in uh, our production side of things. So we still go out and obtain uh, new plant material every year. We go out into the field and we might hand collect from any given area or ecological region, or even larger than that, we might go to uh, say the, uh, the coastal plain in the South. So we, we still collect and hand collect new material. We bring that back home and we grow it out in a greenhouse. And um, then we take those plugs make larger scale production fields, and then we harvest those and we continue to increase in that side. So, and I still uh, have a lot going on in our day-to-day -day business, as well as plans for old plantings, new plantings, and uh, I work with Robert on some of the jobs as well. So what is the story behind Roundstone Native Seed? I know a bit of it because I've been there multiple times. I mean, you guys are essentially in my backyard. Um, you're my closest native seed company about an hour and a half away from me, but for everybody else, can you tell us a little bit about the story of Roundstone, how you guys got started? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. So uh, we live here in South Central Kentucky. My family's been in Hart County for a little over 200 years. And uh, I grew up as a beef cattle tobacco farmer. That's what I started out doing here on our home farm. And uh, my dad grew up uh, a little bit further west over towards Mammoth Cave. Uh, he was from Montfortville and a lot of his people uh, lived right there on the outskirts. And a lot of what they did was kind of subsistence living whereas uh, my grandmother would take him to the woods and they would collect plants. And that might be for food or for medicine or, or for whatever they're using. So he developed his love for that. And uh, he had moved to East Tennessee for several years and he had a, a woodworking company there. And uh, he sold out and he moved back home. And 
upon his uh, original retirement, uh, he, he took one year off and he wrote the book Wildflowers and Mammoth Cave. So he spent a year in the park, walked a little over 900 miles and uh, documented everything, drew all of his own drawings, took all of his own photographs to make his book. And during that time, uh, he instilled a lot of love for the plants in me as well. Uh, growing up, uh, when I went to deer hunt, we were walking through the woods and he'd say, stop, what's that? And it was a plant, he'd want me to name it and I just wanted a deer hunt, but he imposed upon me that I learned those things. So later on in life, I learned to love them. And uh, so about 26 years ago, we were having a little bit of a rough time. Cattle prices were down. We were losing our tobacco support price and it was very opportunistic. We were looking to diversify. And because he had done such research, he was on the board of the Nature Conservancy. They were very encouraging at the time as well. And uh, we just so happened to live in a rough part of our county uh, that a lot of it's so rough and rocky that it's not been plowed. We had a lot of remnant stands and those remnant stands consisted of up to uh, one very close to us, about three and a half miles away. I think we had over 78 species in a quarter acre. So he and I went out 26 years ago with five gallon buckets and we started hand collecting uh, just a few different seeds. And then from that, it's grown to what we basically do is, uh, like I told you a little bit before, that we go out into the wild, we hand collect seed still to this day. We grow it out in plugs. We take those plugs, put it in an increased plot. We take the seed that comes from that and make a larger increased field. We can have uh, eco type seed commercially available for the regions that it comes out in. We physically have seed in seven different states now, some of which we deal with uh, other producers, some of which we have to do the work on our own, but we try and have seed for the regions that we work in. And so now we have about 250 different species available and um, we, we actively farm a little over 2000 acres. Now that's spread out uh, over the entire area that we were just talking about. And when I say the entire area, that's primarily the east and the southeast, Kentucky, South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, and we even have some stuff out of, of East Texas that we actually grow in Georgia, but all in the way of natives, which are uh, native grasses, wildflowers, weapon plants, that sort of thing. So your eco regions are kind of more the Kentucky and South, correct? Primarily, yes. So NRCS, as rule of thumb, has always been, and there's different publications that say a 250 mile radius to a 350 mile radius of where those plants originated. And this is a this has been a hot topic since we got in this business. I uh, consider myself a bit of a purist, which I've stayed, changed my standpoint somewhat. And this is something that uh, Robert and I constantly butt heads on. Where's the line? Where should it go? Uh, how much does uh, altitude have to do with it? Uh, how much does uh, wetland changes, changes in soils, everything else? So it is our job when we sell seed, when we sell mixes, and about 95% of what we sell goes out in the mix is our, our job first and foremost to make the best moral decision that we can. If we put this seed in this mix, is it appropriate for that area? And sometimes it's not exact, which is what we'd love to do, but we have to get it as close as possible. And so we make sure everybody's aware of that. And this is a, a long process. A lot of times it'll take us uh, three to five years from the time we hand collect a seed to where it's commercially available. Yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it, which we're gonna talk later because, I mean, it's fascinating. And I never really thought about all of the back end work that needs to go into it before the first time I came up there and saw your all's production system. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask if somebody, because we've talked around eco regions some, we've talked, like you were saying, that 250, 300, 400 mile radius and everything. So let's say somebody's listening and they are in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Can they call you guys and say, do you have this species from Tennessee? Sometimes, yes, they can absolutely call and ask us. I mean, we're, we're set up to, to talk to people on the phone. We're not really good salesmen, but we, uh, we like farming and we like native plants. So we're, we're happy to talk about that. So when they ask us specific questions, that's, that's a little bit abnormal for us. We're happy to talk to those people who really know what they're talking about and know what they want. And yes, we may have it or no, we may not have it, but we tell them the closest thing that we do have. And we talk about, you know, that would probably have been in the Big Barrens region. And so it would encompass a large part of Tennessee or if we, we've known it from that area, that sort of thing too. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, sometimes people ask me that question and I know I've been able to call you guys sometimes and say, okay, I'm looking for this. Do you have it in Kentucky or how close can you get me? And you've always been really good about working with me on that as well, which I've always really appreciated. And we try and be open-minded, Jen. I, you know, I, I don't know of any plant that knows where state line is. Exactly. So we try and find it from that general area, that general 
ecosystem eco region and it'll make sure it's appropriate or at least it was listed there but we find out more times than not oftentimes plants are there it just may not be on a website somewhere to tell yeah. us yeah it's always something that is important to remember too that the plants don't obey the state lines at all and yes eastern kentucky and western kentucky are very very different central kentucky and Central Tennessee are much more like than they are to yeah. either end of either state. And if I could, I, I made that statement kind of in jest that I, I started out as a bit of a purist and, and I still am. But one of the first jobs I ever had years and years ago was for Mammoth Cave National Park. And it required that the seed that they needed for the small restoration job they had had to come out within the three county area that it resides in. And I thought, man, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I am. I'm being a purist. It's coming from the right area, going back to the right area. But through years of doing this, what I found was that if I took that limited genetic source and moved it to an area that was much different than what I found it in, that, uh, that it didn't perform well. So I was doing a disservice to people. So now we, we look at things from a, a broader regional aspect. So instead of just getting it out of that small three county area, what we prefer to do is get it from a larger eco region, maybe the Big Barrens area, knowing that if I get a, a larger number of mother plants, to take that seed stock from, I have more genetic diversity. That's when we feel better about it maintaining and persisting in uh, in all those areas that we put it in. Which makes sense. I mean, you do need that. You need that diversity as well. You can go too small. You can go too big. And there's an in between in there. Yes, we we need a happy meeting, but we are able to service a lot of those things. All right. So if it is a pure standpoint, for for instance, like the Francis Mary National Forest, we did a lot of hand collection for them, so we are able to offer that specifically back to them for those areas but it also does well in the areas around so we have an ecotype or a, yeah ecotype as well as a regional ecotype there so you're talking a lot about big stands and big projects do you also work with homeowners like for some, if somebody had a wanted to do a garden not necessarily a big plot because all, maybe all they have is an acre or two absolutely as far as numbers of orders that we do it we have more numbers of orders of people who do small projects. And oftentimes those are people who are the most interested, not that large scale, but something that they're going to look at every single day. So, you know, we, sometimes we sell seed by the ton, by thousands of pounds, and we also sell seed in packets or by the gram. Yeah. Since like uh, 2016, had an orders like quadrupled the number of orders, but most of those are a lot smaller. So as they are. native plants have definitely started to become more in the mainstream. And I think a lot of that's due to pollinator interest as well. That's been a big catalyst for it. Yes. And all the seed I've gotten from you guys has always been really good. The, see, the few that haven't come up, I, I think it's me. I haven't figured out how to germinate them yet because, yeah, native seeds are complicated on the germination on some of them. And, like, I've tried a few others and they didn't come out either. So that's why I said it's definitely something I'm doing. I haven't figured out the germination yet. They're, they're a bit of a conundrum. When we deal with so many different varieties and species, it's, uh, they all have their own way of doing things. And by law, we're required to have a, a third-party test done on each one every 10 months, and it's a lot to keep up with. Can you guys walk through the process with us of how do the seeds that, say, we're buying in the little seed packets, or somebody else is buying a large bit for a pollinator um, planting for, like, pounds and stuff, how do you get those seeds? Because they don't just magically appear in the packet. So can you walk us through the, okay, here's the plant growing and. Okay, so I, I guess we can revert back just a little bit. You know, I, I told you that we, we hand collect. That's still a big portion of what we do and how we, we get our new seed stock. And then I briefly said that we, we grow it out in the greenhouse. Then we put it in production, a lot of which is under drip tape irrigation, very small. And some of which we use what's called plastic culture, which we have a, a sheet of plastic that we put down uh, on the ground to inhibit weeds because we don't have very many herbicides we could use. And we don't really want to use herbicides or pesticides because they're pollinating plants. So we mitigate that with the plastic culture when, when it's feasible. I can use a very small amount of water utilizing the drip tape irrigation. So through the growing season, we have crews, all of us. And that's the one thing when you come to work for Roundstone, we say that, that our your job description is whatever we have to do that day. And that's, that's not easy. It's not what people really want to deal with either, but all of us, we, we may be out picking seed. We may be pulling weeds when it's time to do that. Or we may be in, in Boston at a show. Who knows where we'll be at? A lot of the wildflowers have to be weeded every few weeks. They have to be watered continuously. The grass field is not quite as bad, but we do have to physically burn most of all of our warm season grass fields every year. 
which can take almost a month to do prescribed fire on each and every one of those. That uh, makes almost a 50% increase in my yield. It, it invigorates them, it kills the bad insects that uh, tend to get in our seed, things like midges. It is also a free herbicide in that it kills most of the broadleaf weeds when we do a growing season burn prior to our harvest. Uh, some things we do have to use herbicides on, but we're very limited in what we do. Uh, just mentioned before, we, we do not like that at all. This is primarily grass when we do that, but uh, it's, uh, it's almost, for lack of a better word, it's almost like chemotherapy in that we have to get rid of the bad before we can do the good. Most herbicides, if any, that we use are prior to us putting a crop in the ground, and those crops can last for many years. The wildflowers, on the other hand, some are annuals, some are biennials, some are short-lived perennials, and some can live for a really long time, but they only produce seed for a short time, and there's no book. So that's all trial and error for us. So after we go through a season of weeding and weeding and weeding and weeding, hoping everything goes well, hoping we don't get smuts or bad insect infestations on things like milkweeds with aphids, our molds don't get under cell fumes and take a whole crop for us. Uh, a lot of those things we have to hand harvest as well. And so we do have a lot of mechanization going on. I do have large rotary combines that we do our grass fields with. I have uh, very small mini combines, we call them, that are about six feet wide, and one of which is three. The stuff that we have to hand harvest, much of which, like, uh, like the cell fumes, are indeterminate seeders. So maybe that whole crop only... Uh, a fifth of it is ripe any given day. Next two days, we'll go get another fifth, fifth, next three days more. So we have to go out and just hand pick the, the flowers that are ripe the day they are ripe. Then they have to be dried out. And then we have to make sure that birds and insects and mice don't get into that. And some things when they seed, uh, for instance, lopsided Indian grass, which is one of the Southern species, over the last 15 years, we figured out that it has three days and that's it. When it's ripe, it's ripe, and if we don't get it at the right time, it will fall off and hit the ground. Oh wow! And if it's raining and stuff, it doesn't matter. That's absolutely right. And if it rains when it has that moment in life, then it will most likely hit the ground as well. So we start harvesting in May, and we don't normally finish uh, until December on our most southern species. So we're also cleaning seed during that time. As soon as we're done in May, we clean seed year-round now, trying not to kill ourselves, but we work five to six days a week and uh, through the winter months, we, most of the time we work double shifts, uh, at least on the large facilities. We have three separate facilities that we screen, or we screen and clean and condition seed in, uh, just different lines, larger lines. With commodity crops, it only takes a few machines, but with us, it's as much as a 17 step process to de-beard and uh, to de-own and to be able to separate all the, all the seeds that we deal with. Now, for those that may not be as familiar, what do you mean by de-beard and de -own? All right, so, so most crops people think about corn, wheat, soybeans, oats, alfalfa, clovers, all those things. Most of them are slick. They're flowable. And that's where most seed conditioning plants are, are built. And with what we have, the nature of natives is, is uh, that they were carried naturally. They've not been changed in any way. They're still pure. So they have texture to them. They have beards on them, like Indian grass, and big blue, little blue, things like that. Uh, Desmodiums will, will stick together. They're, they're initially native Velcro. Uh, a lot of things will have beards and appendages, uh, beggar ticks, tick seeds. It, you know, they all have a name that, that lets us know that they stick, and they stick together. So we have non-flowable products that we have to condition to the point that they will flow enough we can separate because we have to get them clean. By state and federal law, we can't have weed seeds in them. Hopefully we've done a really good job keeping those weeds out of the field. Hopefully we did a good job that they weren't in the combines. It, it takes about four hours to switch out a machine to climb in it, tear it apart, and vacuum it out. And, uh, but there cannot be any contamination anywhere along the way. So it's essential that we do a good job when we do that. So once we get those seeds where they can be flowable, then I am able to separate. And another part of natives that is different from, from any other seeds in any other industry is that by law, we sell on a pure live seed basis. That is only the part of the seed that is in that bag that is viable are we able to get paid for that was put in place in the early CR, days of early CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, to protect the consumer because they were getting big bags of trash and fluff and sticks in empty seed holes. So we have to know what's good. We have to know what percentage is good so we can make the mixes so we can be accurate as well. I feel like I skipped around there quite a bit. Did I mix out on any steps? 
Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of steps here. And, stuff. and so you're going out and you're growing. First of all, you go, you collect your initial seed mm -hmm. from the wild. And I'm assuming you're very careful about not over collecting too from any one location. Absolutely. So when we do do an initial collection, we want a, a fairly large area. I want a, a large number of mother plants, donor plants. Primarily what we do is we take the U.S. Forest Service guide for collection. So we don't take any more than 50% of, of anything we see in that area, we leave the rest, and then we do the latitude, longitude coordinates. Uh, we describe the area, the land type, uh, if it's wet, if it's dry, all, everything about our soils, also what plants we found around it. And so we, we have documented where that source seed came from. And then the seeds that we collected from that general little region, we put those together, and that's what we propagate out. So we do have some, some more diversity in it. Okay. And when you're growing them like that, is it all on roundstone land or do you have other farmers and such that grow for you? Well, so I, I'm, I'm somewhat limited here at home. If, if you can see where we're at, it's just hills and hollows and kind of rocking. It's, mm -hmm. it's not really conducive to seed production uh, as to some other folks in, in our line of work in our business. They have one big farm with center pivot irrigation and everything's right there. So we're fairly spread out. So we also rent farms and we lease farms. In, uh, in the four counties around us. And I told you I had all that production in all those other states as well. Mm -hmm. So we've collected the initial seed, we've grown it out, made our larger plots, got our larger production plots. Some of those, when it finally gets time to harvest, which, does everything get harvested the first year or do you often have to wait two, three years? What's the timeline on that? So that, that's the thing. So when we find them in the wild, it may be opportunistic. Like, hey, we came across this, or <clears throat> excuse me, we may have set out looking for it at the same time. Most time, if it's an annual, yes, we hope to get that crop that year. We've lost it, but it's usually uh, maybe a fifty percent crop the second year. In the third year is when we can expect to get our first good crop, and then we have to figure out how what the longevity of that crop is, how long it'll stay, and maybe there's ways that we can manipulate it to get it to growing again. Oftentimes, that's the case with our our grasses. Mm -hmm. Once they get root bound, they, they don't like to make new offspring. It's just kind of like they're saying, hey, everybody stop. There's enough kids, no ball, no more. We're all good. John, you might uh, mention to us, how do we know when it's ready to harvest? I guess I should have hit on that too. That, that's major for us, Shannon. So the way we figure out if something's ready to harvest, what we don't want to do is spend all this time, labor, effort, traveling, equipment, whether it's by hand, all this stuff, if it's not ready, we've just wasted it. And I've done this so many times. So we physically go take samples and we check it and we check it and check it. There's, um, there's three really nice microscopes in here. One's in my office, one's in Jeremy's, one's in the main part. So we physically tweeze that seed out and we gauge it. And we will take out of the collections we do and we'll do a large collection from a field. We'll take a hundred seeds and we'll figure out where we're at. And if it's not ready, we don't deal with it. And most of the time, just by physically looking at the seed, uh, especially with my father, Randy, he's, he's really sharp at it. He can, he can probably get us within 5% of what that actual test is going to be later on down the road. If it's at a milk stage, seed is often milky. We don't touch it yet. We're waiting for that to continue to ripen. Or it might be a medium dough, uh, which is like if you take bread and wad it up and put it between your teeth and you can just kind of sink your teeth in it. Or then it's a, a hard dough, which you put that seed in your mouth and it physically cracks like a kernel. At that stage, we're we're almost too late, so we have to find that happy medium. And we have to be ready to go, and we have to continually check things over and over and over. There is definitely a lot of work into this. And then I've been out to Brownstone, like I said earlier, and I've seen the production and seen the machines and all the different steps and the screens that you have to go through to make sure that it's clean, to get all the fluff and the, like you were saying, the sticks and the all that stuff out of it, and to really make sure it is nice, good, clean, good quality seed that's coming out. And it's different for every single type of seed, I would assume. Absolutely, and I, and I told you our ability to de-own and to de-beard, but there's limits to what we can do. I, I could make, and I started out, I thought all seed had to look like fescue and orchard grass and those seeds that I dealt with with beef cattle because I'd never seen anything else. And I assumed it had to look like that. And that's what we strive for when we were able to do it. But some seeds are extremely fragile. And to get them to that point, I can actually damage the seed. So if you if you get an order from us one time in this particular mix, you might open it up like, man, that's really slick and flowable. Look at that. And the next time, like, wow, what is this? There's all this, this fluff to it. But those are species like little blue stem that have a really elongated small seed. And if you get aggressive with it at all, you'll, you'll snap them and break them. 
wiregrass is a, is a coastal plain seed and it's probably the best example of that. And just with your fingers, you can crush them. So you, you have to sell it in a fluffy form. And going over there and seeing what you guys do and getting a better understanding of all the work that it takes to get these native seeds into the little packet. I usually buy by the little packet. Um, we haven't started doing the larger scale projects on our farm yet, but yeah, to see what it gets takes just to get there. It really starts to make sense why, why native seeds cost more than the generic seed, wildflower seed mixes, which I think that's another thing that is important to recognize is that when you go to generic box store, you see the generic big bag of wildflower seeds. First of all, wildflower is not native. I think a lot of people get that mixed up. They're not the same thing. And also those generic mixes also have a lot of filler in them a lot of times to make them spread more. Whereas what you guys are selling, it's nothing but seed. That's right. And it's so if it's something that's not available on the market, oftentimes that's what we're shooting for. Things in the wild that are not available for restoration or maybe uh, uh, national forest or state park, some, somebody wants them for some reason. So we try and go over those things. But we don't know how to price them. Uh, I mean, we have to figure out what time we have invested in. We have to figure out how long they grow, uh, how much seed they'll produce per acre. So it's, it's a lot to keep up with. I, I wanted to botanize. I didn't want to do math, but we have to do a lot of math to figure out what the value of that is and, and is it worth it. You know, we, we have a goal to, to do restoration, to, make, to do a little good in the world, but at the same time, we, we're a company and we have to make money. So we try and be economical as possible. A lot of what we do is still pretty rudimentary. The things that we spend the most time on, things like uh, uh, butterfly milkweed, beautiful plant, but it's, it's just really, really rough to deal with between the aphids and the timing of harvest of it. And when the pods are ready or they're not ready, you go through it every day with, with buckets and, and hand pick. And then it just takes a long time to clean. It's just a lot invested. in. Yeah. Once you start to see and understand, at least from my perspective, once you start to see and understand what all goes into it, I mean, it is a very good value that you guys are offering because there is so much involved and there's so much labor. I mean, like you said, a lot of it's hand labor. There is no way to mechanize this. Agreed. And, and the ability to find labor to help us with that has been tougher and it keeps continuing to get tougher for us as well. So what would you recommend for someone who's wanting to start a new pollinator garden, we'll say, because so many people are so interested in pollinators right now and doing pollinator gardens. So. What would you suggest for some site preparation? Let's say somebody's starting a new garden. Let's, how would you suggest they could do the good site preparation to have these native seeds grow and do well? So on the site prep, uh, one of the main things we want to first start out looking at it is what's the current land use that they're dealing with um, and, and the size that they're wanting uh, to go with. So the land use would be like, is it currently in a crop field? You know, or is it currently lawn or turf grass? Is it a fallow field or hay field if you've got an extra one acre uh, over there on the side or if you're just trying to do it in an old flower bed where you're trying to do 10 square feet. So we want to identify which one of those land uses it is because that's going to tell us how much site prep is going to be needed for each of those. For instance, you know, in a crop field, a lot of times they've been doing herbicide applications and that's been actually keeping the weeds under control. So they've actually been doing some site prep for you. Uh, whereas if you were going into a fallow field or, you know, a hay field, you're looking at a lot more weed competition. And the most important thing that you can do for site preparation is weed control, because that is the number one reason for stand failures is improper weed control where they, uh, because natives, they're a lot slower to grow. So everything that you're used to, like the fescues and the clovers, all of those have been selectively bred to germinate quickly. Uh, and they've also been selectively bred for other traits as well. But uh, natives have not been that way. We have not selectively bred them for anything. And so they actually have uh, a long germination window, meaning that if you plant the, you know, two seeds side by side and give them water within the same day, you know, one may germinate within a few weeks. One may not germinate for another 60 to 120 days uh, from that from that watering. Uh, and basically what that is, is that's nature's insurance, right? So when you plant fescue, that's why everybody, when you plant fescue, you're so worried about trying to get it watered and get everything, you know, in prime condition, growing conditions, uh, because it all germinates at the same time within two weeks. Well, if weather conditions turn off bad, the fescue dies out. 
Whereas natives who have not been selectively bred and they had this long germination window, some of those same species, they may germinate, but not all of them germinate, right? Like I said, at the same time. So if the weather conditions turned off bad for it, that, that one that germinated, yes, it will die off, but there's others that haven't germinated yet that will then come on. So it can help persist the stand. Like I said, it's just nature's insurance to make sure that, uh, that things will go on. So, but they have a really long germination window. And they also, once they germinate, they're also a lot slower to grow compared to a lot of the introduced or naturalized species that we have in America here. So when they're, when they're that much slower, uh, at growing, it allows for things to outcompete them easily. So all those introduced and naturalized plants, they germinate quickly and they grow quickly, which then can end up uh, choking out your young native seedlings or even preventing them from germinating. So that's why weed control is the most important thing uh, that you can get done uh, when you're doing site prep for your native grasses. But, you know, so first off, when we're looking at, like when I said, you want to identify the land uses. So if you had a fallow field or a hay field, you may be looking at having to use herbicide applications. Uh, and depending on the size you do, so basically the different types of prep that you can do is a herbicide application. Uh, solarization uh, can also be used for small areas, uh, as well as what's called a repeat tillage application. Uh, and those, the last two, solarization and the repeat tillage, they're mainly for like your backyards, very smaller projects, and they also are only recommended when there's not like invasive species that are involved in the plantings. But uh, so when, I, like I said, with the fallow fields and stuff, you're going to have to do a lot more of that site prep. So for instance, for a herbicide application, you may be looking at three to five sprays or, or, or herbicide treatments before you can plant your natives. Uh, but if it was in like a lawn or turf situation, you may only be needing, because you've been continuously mowing it, so you've been keeping the weed pressure down a little bit, you may be able to get away with two to three herbicide applications, you know, excluding like turf grasses like Bermuda. That's a whole different ball game, whole, whole topic of itself, so we won't go into that. But uh, Whereas like with a crop field, you may only need one to two herbicide applications because they've been doing the weed control for you. Uh, and if you were to translate that to solarization, it's the length of time. So with a crop field, you can solarize it a lot faster uh, than you can, say, with a fallow field or a hay field. You're going to need to have at least one, maybe even two years worth of solarization on that, uh, especially if there's uh, rhizominous species or species that spread other than, other than their seed, like by roots. You may have to go and, and do it for up to two years sometimes. So one of the big things I see a lot of people, especially in a small backyard situation, is you want to make sure you don't bite off more than you chew. So start off small. Uh, you know, you don't want to get over, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I, I get gung-ho on it and I'll, I'll end up, you know, should have only done about a quarter acre, but I'll, I'll do a full acre. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you have to kind of keep in mind as to how much work you want to do. Because obviously the smaller amount of work you do, You'll be able to go post, you know, after post planting, you'll be able to go in there and do some hand art or hand selection of weed control and, and get things out on small 10 by 10 plots. Whereas if you're planting one to two acres or even five acres, if, you're, if you have a 10 acre yard and you're trying to cut it in half, you know, it's going to be a lot less labor that you're going to want to do on 10 acres versus a 10 by 10 uh, square foot plot there. Yeah, I'm kind of like you. I have a tendency to bite off a bit more than I can chew and make yeah. way too big of garden beds to start out with. And then it's like, oh crap, what did I do? And I spend the next two, three years trying to make up for that mistake. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So once you, I mean, once you get, get the process down, that's, that's what we're trying to deal with. So first you want to start off small, get that process down, know what kind of uh, site prep you're going to do. Because what, what's pretty interesting is once you start removing, especially if you're in a turf grass situation or you know, uh, in a fallow field situation, once you remove the existing vegetation, there's that seed bank underneath there that's full of millions of seeds uh, and, it's, and it's waiting to explode. So once you remove that stuff, you get to see what comes back up in there. And that's why we oftentimes say you need to do multiple applications. So multiple herbicide treatments or even multiple tillages or um, even sometimes multiple sol uh, solarizations 
allowing that seed bank to germinate so you can see what comes up. Sometimes it's good stuff. I mean, you do get good stuff that come back in there depending on what your land use was. Uh, but a lot of times you can get a lot of the bad weeds in there that you want out. So you definitely need to look out for the invasive species. Look around to see if you have anything like Johnson grass out there, uh, anything like Cerisa lespedeza out there. So these are very common ones. One that's hidden a lot and really likes the disturbance, especially, you know, no matter what you're doing, crop field, lawns, or hay field, crabgrass, right? We remove it, and crabgrass is a warm season grass. So when you have, <clears throat> that's one thing a lot of people also mess up as is they go out there and they do one treatment and they get, you know, a good kill on all of it. And they think they've got a good uh, site bed prepped, ready to go. What they did is they disturbed that area. And sometimes, a lot of times, they don't do it in the cool season. So they'll do it in the spring or they'll do it in the fall. And they've knocked out those cool season weeds, but they never got the warm season weeds that were laying dormant when they actually did their treatment. So then the warm season weather comes around and then boom, we get a flush of crabgrass and Johnson grass coming in there. So we always recommend that you get at least from like a crop field situation, it's just really good to have at least one shot at uh, cool season weeds and one shot at warm season weeds if you can, you know, depending on how well clean the farm was kept before you actually go to plant. Uh, and then from like a fallow or hay situation, we're recommending at least two shots at warm season and two shots at cool season weeds. So the cool season weeds will now be the fescues, the clovers and all that. Whereas the warm season weeds is like what I was talking about, the Johnson grass, the crab grass, the foxtail. That's, that's the kind of things that we're looking for to knock those out. And like I said, sometimes it can take, you know, it can take a whole growing season for us to get, especially on larger plantings. So the smaller plantings, we can get by with a little bit less uh, uh, site prep because you can handle some of the weed competition post fact. But when you get into the larger ones where you're trying to do half acres and acres or even larger, we're definitely spending, you want to spend as much time doing site prep and weed control before you plant. Because once you plant, your hands are really tied on what you can and cannot do. And it becomes a lot more labor intensive once you put the native uh, grasses and wildflowers in the ground. So you've given a pretty good idea of the crop field and the uh, hay field, these larger areas. Things that, like you were saying, you'd measure in acres. What would you suggest for the site prep schedule if it was a garden in a yard? Something that we would say we would measure by square feet instead of acres, just to put a size boundaries on it. Right, right. So, so on the smaller ones, you know, thousand square feet or ten by tens, even uh, ten feet by ten feet. You know, we can <clears throat> we can get by with a little bit less. So, if it was a lawn situation and you're doing a herbicide application. Depending on what your lawn is, a lot of our lawns around here in Kentucky are fescue, so that's a cool season grass, right? So we, we can apply a herbicide when it is actively growing. That is what we're trying to do. So when it's actively growing, we apply the herbicide. But then I want to definitely wait. So especially in a lawn situation, the crabgrass will really try to jump up on you. Um, you can have a good solid kill on that fescue, but then it may be four to six weeks later, here comes that crabgrass. So you wait around and you try to get that. Uh, another shot at the, the warm season uh, weeds like crabgrass. If you do that, what you can do is you can look around and see and kind of feel. You get a, you get to look around and you, you kind of know whether or not how much weed pressure you have. So if you spray something and it's instantly coming back and jumping up on you, then you're going, you know, be ready to put that second application down. And if it still jumps back really quick, you have a lot of weed pressure. So you need to continue uh, your applications or your treatments until you slow that down enough so that you're having an effect to reduce that seed bank that's there of the weed seeds trying to explode. So it's similar, it's, it's similar from a large scale to a small scale. It's just with a small scale, you can get away with a little bit less because you can do, you're more apt to do on a 10 by 10 square foot planting, you're more apt to do post planting maintenance on it. Whereas, you know, an acre, you're not, you know, really going to do that. You're not gonna be out there hand weeding an acre to three acre field. Right, right. So, and then, like when we were talking about with the tillage, you can do the you can do the tillage is another option that we had talked about uh, on the small scale, especially. So you go in the first time. What you'll do is you you'll go in and you till it all up. And a lot of times your tillers are getting like four inches down into the ground with your hand tillers. Uh, so you till all that up, get a good clean uh, seed bed, nice prep like you would for your regular garden. Then what you want to do is you want to wait. 
You want to sit back and you want to allow for those weeds that you just exposed. Because every time you disc or till, you're exposing new weed seeds. So once they get exposed, then that's when <clears throat> you want to come back. And it, sometimes, depending on the rain, it can be every you know three to four weeks easy. You can have a little bit of new growth coming up. And so you'll start doing more tillage after that. So you get that good deep tillage first, but then the rest of the tillage after that, you need to do real shallow tillage. Basically, just just enough to kill those uh, plants that have already germinated and started growing. So you're only looking at one, two inches max. If you try to keep going and keep doing four to six inches, you know, tillages, you're never going to deplete the amount of seed. Like you just keep exposing them because there's millions of them. But if you just try to get that top inch layer after your first deep tillage, just enough to kill those germinated plants, then you kind of help reduce that seed bank down. But that's that's basically what we do is we go in there for those small ones. Uh, you go in and and you get that nice whether you've done the herbicide treatments or the solarization or the um, tillage operation. We've got all the weeds under control. And then basically what we're doing is we're going out there and. We're doing what we call the footprint test. The footprint test, we walk out there and I take a I take a step onto the planting area. And if my footprint goes more than a quarter inch deep, then I need to roll or pack that site down before planting the seeds. So you can roll it with a cultipacker or a physical roller that goes behind an ATV. For smaller areas, you can use a, an actual tamp. There's a, a piece of equipment called tamp or even the back of a shovel. Just to, just to lightly tamp the area down. People even use their feet to go in there to firm that soil up because most natives don't want to be planted more than a quarter inch deep. Most of the natives is about an eighth of an inch deep to no more than a quarter of an inch deep. And you would rather the seed be laying on top of the soil than planted too deep. Because if it does, they won't, some of them won't even germinate. So you really lower your success rate by doing that. So that's probably the the second largest reason for stand failures is people planting them too deep. A lot of times, especially uh, some of the old planting techniques for other species of naturalized uh, species, they people seed it and then they disc it in. And you can't do that with natives. So if you were to try to do that, you would, you would cover them too deep. But basically we go in there and we do that footprint test. That footprint test is gonna be absolutely crucial when it comes to the tillage method. Because with the tillage method, right, you keep exposing the soil so you're making it loose, making it very soft. You can throw it right on top of there and you don't even have to cultipack culti afterwards, but if you hadn't done that cultipacking beforehand, the rain can even push it too deep. So that's why you want to cultipack before or tamp it down before you broadcast the seed uh, to make sure you have a good firm seed bed. Then after you broadcasted the seed onto it, then you'll want to come back and roll it or tamp it again to make sure you're getting good seed to soil contact. So that's one of the things. And the footprint test, if you go in there and you try to make a footprint, but you don't make one, this is pretty common in solarization because you've had that plastic sitting there making it very firm ground on you. If you go in there and that um, footprint doesn't make anything at all, then what you'll need to do is you need to lightly rake that surface up. So you can take a hard rake if you have one, preferably, and sometimes even some of the leaf rakes work, or you can rake any of the litter away or thatch away, and then you just lightly rake that ground. And you're only trying to expose it, remember, about one eighth of an inch deep. That's all you're trying to do. You're not trying to create you know, a half inch worth of soil exposed there. So you're just lightly raking the top of the ground, then you broadcast the seed, but then you also still need to come back afterwards and uh, roll or tamp that site down to make sure you're getting good seed to soil contact on those. And with that solarization method, do you need to wait to see if anything germinates before you put or just solarize it and then after you waited that long, take it off and good to go, good to rake, good to go? Uh, a lot of people actually put the solarization down. They do it for a long period of time and then they go right in directly after it. I kind of actually prefer to pull it up once and allow it to germinate to see um, how well everything underneath it is. Like I said, a lot of times you'll see a quick response if you have a lot of weed pressure. So if you have an, if, if I pull it off and pretty quickly within, you know, two weeks to a month, I'm getting a lot more germination. I know there's a lot of weed pressure there. So I need to put, I let it actually germinate just a little bit more to get as much of those weed seeds to germinate. And then I'll lay the, lay the plastic back down on top of that. Uh, the problem with solarization is obviously 
you have to get enough plastic so it's better for smaller areas. Some ways you can look at uh, getting some with the old greenhouse plastic, finding a local greenhouse that may have some, or you may even already have a greenhouse of your own. You can try to use some of it uh, or buy the black plastic. Some people use black plastic, some people use clear. The other problem is you always have to stay on top of it. So you bury the edges, right? So you lay that plastic down and, and you dig a trench around your planting area and you lay that plastic in there and then you cover it back up. And that's to help keep the wind from blowing your plastic all the way around. But uh, depending on where you're at, if you have deer in the area or anything, you always have to go back and constantly monitor monitor it and make sure that there's no holes getting into the plastic. So a lot of times deer will walk over and poke holes in it, which then that will allow moisture to get in and, and uh, light to get in, um, which will allow weeds to germinate and grow in those holes. So you wanna be able to make sure you get those fixed as soon as possible. So you have to constantly uh, be monitoring that and checking that. And I'm assuming that like if you're using cardboard, um, it's the same thing. It's just cardboard instead of plastic. It's the same, yeah, different, different material. You can, use the, you can use the cardboard. There's different ways of solarizing. You know, I'm even like at my house right now, I'm actually doing, um, I'm using straw. So a very thick, like, you know, kind of like the Ruth Stout method of uh, gardening, same principle, you know, a very thick mat of uh, straw laid down, let it decompose all winter long uh, and break that area down. Is a lot of times with native seeds, you don't actually need a whole lot of seed for your area. So sometimes it is beneficial to have a, a carrier that goes with it. Uh, for instance, you know, if you're trying to do a thousand square feet or 2000 square feet uh, in your uh, backyard there, you may only, your seed may fit in the palm of your hand, you know, and you're trying to get it over 2000 square feet. So that can be kind of difficult. So a lot of times what we'll do is we mix in a carrier with it, which can be anything from pelletized lime or even kitty litter. Uh, you can use kitty litter to mix it in there to give you more weight um, to help spread over. Cause a lot of people, when they go out there, especially if they've never broadcasted seed before, they go out there and they run out of seed very quickly. So for anybody that has not broadcasted seed before, I recommend definitely getting a carrier and practicing with it first, because it's a lot cheaper to practice with the carrier than it is with the native, native seed mix there. Uh, and then some other options that they can do is they, you know, they can actually get a nurse crop. We, we plant a lot with nurse crops. And that will actually give you some additional weight. So like a cool season nurse crop that we use is oats. Uh, we can use oats at like 20 to 32 pounds per acre. Uh, of course, you can break that down and go lower with, you know, by square feet. But we actually use that. Um, that gives us the weight while we're broadcasting it and, and allow us to get out over the whole area, make sure we get good even coverage. But it also will germinate quickly compared to the natives. And we use it at such a low rate that it will germinate quickly. It will give you, uh, it takes away that eyesore of bare ground quicker, <laughs> but it also is an erosion control. And it also uh, helps suppress some of the, uh, the weeds that want to jump off and take off on you like the crabgrass and everything. And then we also use, in the summertime, we also use something from the brown top millet would be our nurse crop. And we can use it at like four to six pounds per acre. And by planting it out there, not only does it do those two things by helping control uh, erosion and suppress weeds, but it also can act as like a little greenhouse. So when we're doing a warm season planting out there or a growing season planting, you know, between you know late April to, to June time frame, or even early July if we're having a lot of rain, that brown top millet will create a greenhouse effect. And it actually allows for uh, that area to help hold in soil moisture, which is absolutely crucial during the uh, during the summer months, the hot summer months, and allows for those native rosettes <clears throat> of the wildflower species to grow and develop underneath those uh, that nurse crop of brown top millet. So it's been a been a big help for us. And when would you suggest planting? Because I know some some species need a winter to germinate. Some need a winter or summer and another winter on some of the more complicated species. But yeah, when when would you suggest? Because you're talking about also growing season planting there. Right. You know, so especially if they're doing, if they're not doing individual species, so if they're, you know, individual species will have a, an actual, you know, amount of things that they need to do um, very specific. So most of the time when they're doing these pollinators or these meadows, it's, it's a mixture of species. So what's more important to me than timing is weed control. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me when I plant this as much as it does is make sure I've got those weeds under control. So a lot of times people will try to pick what, time of year they want to get it planted and they will stick to it no matter what 
So, if, you know, they, they're thinking, you know, okay, I want to do, I want to do a dormant season planting because that's the next available planting date. And it's already, you know, November or it's already, you know, it's maybe even October and they haven't done any site prep, but they want to do that because that's the next planting window. I would, <clears throat> I would recommend that you identify what your process is going to be, what your land use is going to be, and then make sure that you get as much of that done. And then that will decide when you actually plant, which would either be a, a dormant season planting, which would be basically in this part of the world from mid November through early March, even is when you can do a dormant season planting. And the pro behind that is if you do a dormant season planting, you're getting what's called cold moist stratification of your plants. And so basically what that is, is that is the plants are physically uh, going through a process with the moisture hitting the ground and the freezing and thawing of the ground. It's breaking that seed coat down uh, and it's allowing them to break dormancy. So a lot of people don't realize a lot of, especially native seeds, have a high degree of dormancy. They're alive, they're viable, but they sit there and they lay dormant. So most natives ripen in the fall or in the summer months, they fall off and then they sit there and lay dormant all winter long. So that's one of the benefits of a dormant season planting is you are getting that natural process to happen right away. So you actually shorten the germination window of some of the wildflower species in particular, so that you get more germination of those within the first year. The other style of planting would be a growing season planting, which um, is for this part of the world, mid April to June timeframe, the end of June. Is when we try to get in. Sometimes we go a little bit into July if we get a lot of moisture in there like we have these past few years. So <clears throat> by doing that, it's a growing season planting, which is actually a little bit better for a lot of the grasses that we're planting with that. Some of the native grasses, a lot of native grasses are warm season plants. So that's actually better for them. But those wildflowers and those ones that need those cold moist stratifications, you can actually do an artificial cold moist stratification by putting those plants in a sand mixture, a moist sand mixture, and putting them in the refrigerator uh, for one to three months if you need to, depending on the, the species that you're doing there. Some people do that artificially before they plant during the growing season. And then other times you can actually just plant them as you get them and they just sit there and they will lay dormant until they go through that process that next winter. So you might not get as much germination that first year which they'll go through that process that coming up winter of cold moist stratification, and then they actually germinate the next year. Patience is key when it comes to natives. <laughs> yes, that's what I've learned too, just trying to plant what I plant and grow here and plant and sell and stuff. So that's right, that's right. Yeah, like we said, they haven't been selectively bred. So you got to deal with that long growing season and long germination window. Yes, exactly. Is there anything else either of you would like to um, share? Uh, I was just going to mention, I did start off saying it and I got sidetracked, but the, uh, you know, so, so for dormant season planting, the, the pro behind it is you go through that cold moist stratification, but the con behind it is you get some winter rot loss. So you do kind of, especially depending on the species, uh, you may have to bump up some of the rates of seeding rates that you have of some of those species to account for some of that winter rot loss. Also, uh, one of the cons behind a dormant season planting is if you did not do the proper site prep before you planted, then that next spring when everything germinates, <laughs> you're in for a rude awakening. So you definitely, if you're going to attempt to do a dormant season planting, you need to be sure that you have spent that growing season beforehand doing your site prep to get you uh, all those weeds under control. And then the growing season planting, obviously the con behind it is you're not going to that cold moist stratification. But the pro behind it is generally you can use a little bit lower seeding rates and then you also get more shots at the weed control. So you're actually, you are in there fixing to do the planting when all those weeds are actively growing and you know what kind of weed pressure you have at the time of planting. And Shannon, I guess I, if I could, uh, when we talk about things, especially Robert and I, our, our main concern is to make sure people get good stands. They, the end goal is not to buy seed. The end goal is to have flowers and plants and grasses. So we don't mean for it to sound complicated. It, there is a little bit to it. It's not that bad. And we, we have uh, manuals available online and there's a lot of good literature out there. It certainly isn't overly complicated. We just really want to encourage people to take a little time to make sure that they do it right. That way they'll have success. Oh yeah. And I agree. And that's one thing I really like about talking to you guys too, is that you are so 
focused on making sure that it works for people, that we get what we're wanting with the pretty flowers and the pretty grasses and the habitats that work. And the two main things I really wanted to talk about today was what's the background of seeds, because I think that's something that most of us don't realize unless you're in the field or doing that, or like I've been lucky enough to do, come up there and see it myself, but also that site preparation, because it's the stuff that's often skipped. I mean, let's face it, it's cold, it's dreary, it's yucky during the winter. We want to start growing. So we start making all these plans and then it's like, okay, spring, let's go and start planting. And that's not always the best way to do it. Not if you want to have a really successful stand. And I think another thing, most people are like myself, they want immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. And this is the wrong business for that. So when we plant natives, you know, it just takes them a few years to mature. We, we talk about seasons like there's only four. With them, it, it takes two or three growing seasons. So basically two or three years to be the, the pinnacle stand it's going to be. It's a little bit longer term investment, but once it's there, it's gorgeous. It's awesome. It's, it's what we want it to be. And we, we do some good in the world, but we just have to keep in our mind to, to have patience and to be prepared for, for what it's going to do. That, that old antage goes well for it. First they sleep, then they creep, then they leap. And that's actually really hard for a lot of people to, to grasp. I mean, like I said, media company, you know, it's like, why would it take three years? And, and that's one of the biggest calls that I get and going out with, you know, and doing planting for people is they said, we got a failed stand. You know, they plant it uh, two weeks later, they expect to see something growing. Well, that's not how natives are. And that's some, and sometimes that's why we put in the nurse crop with our species as well. So that two to three weeks later, they can see that instant gratification of something growing. But like I said, natives can take 60 to 120 days to come up. And when they do come up that first year, they may not show, you know, depending on what species you put in there. We try to throw some annuals in there to get you some color faster. But, you know, a lot, a lot of the pretty ones, you know, the twisted perennials, they won't bloom that first year. I mean, they may not even germinate. So <clears throat> some of them will germinate, just put up what they call a rosette, those little basil leaves that stay close to the ground. You know, they'll They'll do that the first year. Well, some of them will sit there and lay dormant the first year, and they won't put up those uh, rosette leaves till the second year. And um, so that means the third year is when they actually bloom. So that's why the third year is normally the largest uh, amount of blooms that you see. So don't give up on it the first year. You know, stay after it. Uh, and we always like people to send us pictures and things to help ID things. And we help ID plants for them, especially when they're not in the blooming stage, when they're a little harder to to identify for the, for the newcomers. And if there are issues, we want to know about it. So if somebody, like I said, we're not very good salesmen, so it's kind of a seed interview. Okay, what are you looking for? Where are you at? What kind of plants? What, what kind of soil do you have? Uh, do you have a plan on planting this? So the people here, we, we do our best to try and take the time to explain that at the onset. We'd rather you be mad at us right away and talk you out of it than we had to be, you'd be mad at us on the back end and to pay for something that you don't get. So it's, uh, it's just a little different, even even myself, my grandfather told me when I told him what I was starting to do and told him how I was doing it, he just scratched his head. He said, son, you don't ever plant nothing in a month that ain't got the letter R in it. And historically, when we do the cool season plants, that's the truth, but that's not the way it is. Yeah, and he was talking about the seed interview. And, and, you know, when we're looking at the seed interview, that's, you know, first things we, you know, ask him, what's your location? And that goes back to our ecotypes and, and the regional ecotypes that we're looking at. So we're trying to send you the closest thing that, that we have to you. Uh, and you may not even know it because a lot of our clients don't even know what they're looking for. Um, you know, we'll ask you, know, where, where are you actually planting this stuff? You know, in the soils. So we want to know, are they wet soils or dry soils? That helps us make a mix for you that's more appropriate. And, and we're also going to look at whether it's sloped or not. You know, if it's got some slope to it and we have erosion concerns and that's when we're definitely going to try to throw in some nurse crops. We might throw in some more annuals with it for you there. Um, and then like you mentioned, we're looking at your planting method because that affects your seeding rates that you have there. Are you going to be drilling this? Are you going to be broadcasting it? <clears throat> Even some of our uh, small scale stuff is getting hydro seeded on construction projects and things. So that all plays a big factor into your seeding rate as well. Uh, and then we're looking at like, is it full sun? So that's something you need to pay attention to, too. Where you're doing your planting, are you are you in the full sun out there? Or are you going to be in the part shade because you're up next to your woods there in your backyard? So definitely pay attention to that full sun, part shade, or deep shade. Uh, that's going to affect what type of plants can actually grow there. And then we also did we mention the the seasons, the growing seasons. You know what are the planting season that you're going to do? So you need to know. Once you get those weeds under control, is that going to line you up for dormant season planting or is it going to line you up for that growing season planting like we talked about? And then 
the other thing would be like the, the land use, like I mentioned, you got to know the land use, not only the current land use, but also the historic land use does help out, especially if you're dealing with on the outskirts, if you have a, a fallow field or a hay field that you're trying to deal with, is you definitely got to, it, it's helpful to know what the historic land use is to make sure that it wasn't a Ceresa farm, you know, back in the 70s. So. Kind of skip around there too as well. It, if for some reason you didn't get the stand that, that you wanted, you know, we, we want you to call in, but very delicately, the first few things we're going to ask is, all right, so, you know, we, we got to ascertain how deep it got planted. We have to ascertain what steps they took and if they herbicided, if they tilled, just what they did and, and at what time, you know, did they come in two days after herbicide when the particular herbicide they use has got a, a two week residual. We, we're trying to make sure of those things, but what we can ensure here is that when that seed goes out that it does have a current test and we know what it is, where it came from, and that it is good. And the likelihood of us sending out a seed packet of a mix that had 120 different species and all 120 different species being bad, that something's amiss if that's the case, because each one of those has been raised in a monoculture stand in a separate field with a separate test. So uh, most of the time it's, it's one of the two culprits or one of the three culprits. It's either too deep weeds or uh, it just got choked out later on. This has been great. It's been fun. Learned quite a bit about the native seed industry and planting and hopefully our listeners did as well. And I will definitely have links to Roundstone's website and the show notes so everybody can go and look at it. And of course, you've got your contact numbers and stuff there as well on the website. That would make it easy for people to call in. I assume that's the best number and way to contact you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again for talking with me today and have a great day. Awesome. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Talk to you soon, Shannon. I really appreciate John and Robert taking time out of their busy schedules to chat with us about native seed production and to share with us their recommendations for planting native seeds. Up until a few years ago, I never really stopped to think about how the native seeds that I enjoy growing got into the seed packets that I purchased. Luckily, I live fairly close to Roundstone Native Seed and have had the opportunity to tour the facility multiple times. I am always completely awed by the process they go through to produce their seeds. I sometimes hear people commenting about how expensive native seeds are, especially certain species. I get it. I used to think they were expensive too. However, after learning about how labor intensive the process is and how much of it still has to be done by hand, I have a much better understanding of why the prices are what they are. The amount of work that goes into the production of those seeds justifies the price in my opinion. The good news is that we usually don't need a ton of native seeds. A little bit can go an awfully long way. I also appreciate Robert sharing some of the recommendations on site preparation and planting your native seeds. Personally, I can't hear this information often enough because I'm as guilty as anyone else of trying to skimp on the site prep and biting off more than I can chew when it comes to creating new gardens. Having made this mistake way more times than I care to admit, even when I know better, I can't stress enough the importance of that initial site preparation and weed control. It really will make or break your final results, and we all want to see you have great success with your new native plants. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask you to please take a minute and go to www.backyardecology.net slash interest dash survey and let me know what you are interested in hearing more about. I use the information from these surveys to guide the topics I cover in the Backyard Ecology blog and podcast. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yards and community.